I'm Patrick. I'm Charlotte. I'm Cass. I'm Len. I'm Andrew. And today we're going to be talking about subcellular fractionation. Subcellular fractionation is a process that relies on centrifuges to separate organelles and protein based off density and size. Cells are initially lysed and then centrifuged multiple times. This results in proteins and organelles that were previously in low concentrations before cellular fractionation to be much more visible if they were even visible beforehand. This, the increased vis visibility allows for much more thorough analysis and study of subcellular components in biochemical processes. So there's a lot of different protocols for subcellular fractionation of different organelles and cellular compartments due to them having different properties. But this is a general overview of the procedure. So step one would be the homogenization process where you lyse the cells. This step really depends on the protein type or organelle you are trying to study, but this step typically includes a hypotonic lysis protocol with low concentrations of non-ionic detergent to separate the whole organelles. The hypotonic solution breaks the cell membrane but leaves the compartments on the inside intact. Step two is the separation of the cellular components that you have. This step also varies a lot with different protocols, but it usually involves differential centrifugation of the homogenate in a series of steps at successively greater speeds. The kind of media you use also varies, but sucrose and glycerol are the most commonly used. The amount of time the centrifugation step takes varies between several hours to overnight, depending on the protocol. For the best purity results, you would have to use density gradient centrifugation, and this process is much longer than sequential centrifugation. But at the end of step two, you should have your supernatant and pellet. Step three is the collection of the fraction you want. Um, the methods again vary, but commonly the fractions are steeped in the sucrose gradient, which will eventually lead to further separation by buoyant densities. The desired cellular fractions can be extracted carefully from here with pipettes. And step four is to assess and verify the purity of your fractions. So this is usually done on a Western blot, which some of you guys might remember from Bio 161. Um, it's a common technique used in cell and molecular bio to identify proteins in the sample and to find the presence of specific protein markers. So going off of that wonderful explanation of the protocol, our analogy, real world example of subcellular fractionation can be seen in gold mining, where you take a random homogenized mixture, homogenized mixture of water, dirt, sediment, but within that is also gold. And as you switch the pan and wait for the heaviest and densest medium to settle to the bottom, that is the equivalent of your precipitate and is the gold that you're after, which will help you strike rich. Um, the medium that's on top that's less dense than the gold is your loose dirt and water, and that's your supernatant, which you're gonna be draining out into the river because that will not get you rich. Finally, the fractionation um, can be stepwise as you get larger and larger gold chunks with successive resuspensions and fractionations, eventually getting to the heaviest, densest, largest gold chunks, which will get you where the big money is at. And yeah. Next, our research paper that we chose was titled Apoptosis Regulation by Subcellular Relocation of Cast Bases. So the purpose of this paper was to characterize the protein localization patterns of a particular family of proteins known as caspases, which are proteo proteases, um, specifically intended to activate subsequent proteases that are integral within the apoptosis sequence. Um, the scientist's hypothesis was a specific sequential time-dependent regulated 
sequence of steps for each individual cast space that would determine their pattern of integration within the nucleus. So there's two key concepts that need to be understood, capsase and protein localization. Capsase is essentially the enzymes that are used in apoptosis and protein localization um, is where proteins are located. And essentially in this, this study, um, observed the changes in the capsase protein localization during apoptosis. So to explain the researchers' methods um, of how they completed the subcellular fractionation for their specific protocol, first they incubated the cell cultures with NP40, which was important to separate out the nuclei from the rest of the cell cells fractions. Then they centrifuged at 800 G for eight minutes to separate out pellet 1A and supernatant 1A. And then for extra measure, they centrifuge S1A, their first supernatant, at 1,500 Gs for five minutes to ensure complete separation of nuclear, nuclear remnants from cell fractions. And that yielded P1B, which was then combined with P1A to yield the pellet 1, which was all nuclear remnants, and S1B, which was the second supernatant um, that was then combined with S1A to give you S1 cytoplasmic fractions. Then the pellet one was then incubated in isotonic lysis buffer and centrifuged at 700 Gs for seven minutes. At supernatant two was extracted to just ensure complete purification of pellet two, which was the isolated nuclear components. That was then resuspended and incubated in DNAase buffer with DNAase 1 and benzoase, and was then moved on for analyses, which will now be talked about by Charlotte and Andrew. All right, so I'm going to start off with that first um, results page that I have to do, and then um, go to the summary. And yeah, let's just kick it off. So three, two, one. The figures on this slide deal with the uh, uh, lysing of the cells that's used for the subcellular fractionation process. And here in figure 1a, we can see that their first attempt was to use something called the Daunt homogenization method along with the NP40 non-ionic surfactant, which is necessary for this process as well, as mentioned earlier. And we can see that by their first attempt, they had really low recovery and in that red box. And so the down somatization is not working. What it usually is good um, for recovering organelles because you like gently like mash your cells and like a glass tube. But they they ditched that and they went to just using the plain NP without the down somatization, and they had better yields. So they and better purity. So they stuck with that. And then for Figure One B they varied concentrations of the non-ionic surfactant. So they used 0.1%, 0.3%, and 0.5%. And what they found is that the 0.1% is not enough for the purity that they were looking for, and that the 0.5% wasn't a significant improvement from the 0.3%. So they settled on the 0.3% for um, their methods after this for all the subsequent lysing of cells that would go on to be through the subcellular fractionation process. And the MP40 is not only necessary for being able to gently lyse the cells, but it's also pretty critical for um, isolating just the nucleus because the nucleus can uh, kind of bind and get squished up on the endoplasmic reticulum. So without the surfactant, um, you get a lot of the endoplasmic reticulum in with the nucleus, which can mess up your results. So having that 0.3% helps you concentrate the nucleus in a good purity. So here we can see figure three from the research paper. And the arrows here are indicating where the 16-hour marks are in each lane. 
So we can see that using the same technique, 16 hours past the treatment with cisplatin, which is a tumor drug, the researchers saw distinct bands arise for certain cast spaces in both the cytoplasm and the nucleus at the same time. The researchers here focused on the 16-hour sightings of the cast space 2, 3, 8, and 9 because their configurations changed once they hit the 16-hour mark. There are high levels of the inactive form in the cytoplasm, but none of it are in the nucleus. Also, once the 16 hours passed after the treatment with cisplatin, the researchers found that the capsaces 2, 8, and 9 were able to move into the nucleus regardless of the presence of caspase 3. This test was performed using cells that did not have the ability to create caspase 3. It was assumed that the other three were dependent on caspase 3 to move into the nucleus, but these results show otherwise. So in conclusion, the researchers found that the caspases, both initiators and effectors, move together into the nucleus to begin destruction during apoptosis by help breaking down the membrane, activating other proteins that are necessary, and directly cleaving proteins. And it's like the general mechanism that is expected for these, but more research needs to go into that. Oh, actually, sorry, Patrick, scratch that. I want to save that for the finish. All right, three, two, one. Here I go again. The researchers concluded that caspases, both initiators and effectors, moved together into the nucleus to begin destruction during apoptosis. The four caspases that the researchers focused on were 2, 3, 8, and 9. Once they moved into the nucleus, were in their active configurations, but they moved independently with each other, which I put in that final summary right there. Is that the initiator caspase proteins and effector caspase 3 move into the nucleus independently instead of being reliant on the caspase 3 that was previously thought in response to apoptotic signals such as those induced by drugs like cisplatin, like prop popular cancer therapy drugs, and they're involved in apoptosis, which an important part of that is nuclear breakdown. Which was the overall goal of the paper, was to figure out where are these proteins localized, how do they move on a time frame, but the exact mechanism of action and what these proteins' exact targets are are still unknown, and our areas of further research.